Tonight, a Toronto neighborhood on edge after a third shooting in just one weekend. This one fatal. I basically grew up here. Like this, this was basically my whole childhood. It's all I ever know. Tensions increase because police say the first two shootings were random. A new report calls out the government on its response to foreign interference. So uh, I think the mantra is too slow, too slow, too slow. And as we approach the 80th anniversary. And many of them were, were much older than me, you know, in those days. Young men. A look at D-Day as you may have never seen it before. From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemanzi. Police in Toronto are searching for multiple suspects tonight after a deadly mass shooting outside of a school. Investigators say up to 20 people were hanging out in the parking lot, a common area to gather in the community, when gunmen arrived and immediately opened fire. Police emphasized this was not a shootout and the victims were just socializing. Greg Ross now with how the attack unfolded, the concern within the community and the demands for answers. After a game of soccer on a quiet Sunday evening, things took a sudden and violent turn. Two suspects pulled up and opened fire on a group of players who had gathered in the parking lot. They located five victims suffering from gunshot wounds. One of those victims has died from his injuries. The others remain in hospital. One of the victims has serious life-altering injuries and the remaining three are being treated for gunshot wounds. All of the victims are older men. Police say the men are 40 to 60 years old and were attacked while socializing after their game. CBC News has identified one of them as Seymour Gibbs. His family says he was shot in the leg three times and had to have surgery. I want justice for my family. His stepdaughter says Gibbs has been playing soccer here for years. I basically grew up here. Like this, this was basically my whole childhood. It's all I ever know. Other friends and family members came to drop off flowers. Police have not released the identity of the man who was killed, but this woman, who did not want to appear on camera out of fear for her safety, says he was a friend. He's a wonderful soul. All you get is a smile. You say hello, and all he does is smile. We're still in shock. We still need answers. We still need to know why. Police say it's not clear what the motive is behind the attack. This was the third shooting in the neighborhood this weekend. Police say the two previous incidents were random one involving a 14-year-old victim. Concern that this latest shooting may also have been random has left many in the neighborhood shaken. This is a community concern, it's community safety, and we all want to make the community safer. And Greg, police say this shooting happened really quickly. Yeah, police described it as a fraction of a minute. They say it was just seconds bef before those two suspects were back in their pickup truck and fleeing the scene. And of course, that has people in this community very nervous, very concerned. And police are doing those, their best to address those concerns. They brought out a mobile command unit that they say will remain on scene for several days. It's a place uh, that they hope people can come and share information if they know anything about any of these three shootings. And they hope that just having a police presence makes people in this community feel a little safer. Ian? Greg Ross in Toronto this evening. A parliamentary report released just hours ago paints a stark picture of foreign interference in Canadian politics and the actions taken to stop it. As Ashley Burke explains, the report says that despite clear warnings and recommendations, the government's slow response has been a failure. Foreign interference is a burning issue on Parliament Hill. Now a new report is exposing extensive attempts to meddle. There's more alarming information in it than anything that we've seen so far. The Prime Minister called for this report last year after leaked intelligence documents revealed incidents of foreign interference and sparked controversy. He tasked a committee of parliamentarians to investigate. They all already have top secret clearances so they can review the activities of our national security and intelligence agencies. After reviewing thousands of intelligence documents, the committee found troubling evidence that some parliamentarians are semi-witting or witting participants in the efforts of foreign states to interfere in our politics, including examples of elected officials accepting funds or benefits from foreign missions or their proxies, giving foreign diplomatic officials privileged information, even providing information learned in confidence to a known intelligence officer of a foreign state.
all of the kind of activity that would go with, with you know, straight out spying on behalf of a foreign power. Justin Trudeau has said his government has been seized with the issue, but the report says it's been slow to act, pointing to the expulsion of Chinese diplomat Zhao Wei. The committee suggests the government dismissed earlier warnings from Canada's spy agency and only acted after it was leaked publicly. I think the mantra is too slow, too slow, too slow. I would disagree with both those assertions. The public safety minister disputes some of the findings, explaining intelligence reports can't give a full picture. Each bit of information is a piece of the puzzle, but to get an accurate picture of all the circumstances, you need more than a few pieces of the puzzle. Actually, this report mentions China a lot, but also highlights India's attempts to meddle. Yeah, Ian, this report's heavily redacted, but three points stand out. It suggests there is intelligence that some MPs may have worked to influence colleagues on India's behalf. There are allegations that proxies transferred funds from India to Canadian politicians at all levels of government in return for political favours, and it claims that India interfered in an unspecified Conservative leadership race. Tonight, the Conservative Party says this is the first time they've ever heard that, and they weren't warned by CSIS. Ashley Burke in Ottawa. There are new questions about one of the four suspects in the killing of Canadian Sikh activist Hardeep Singh Nijjar. He was arrested just before a large gathering of members of the Sikh separatist movement, some considered terrorists by India. And as Evan Dyer explains, it's heightened fears that the plot to kill Nijjar could be just one of many. Of the four men charged in the murder of Sikh leader Hardeep Singh Nijjar, one stands out, Amandeep Singh, yet to enter a plea on any of his charges. Arrested months before the others on the eve of a high-profile wedding that brought together a number of big names on the government of India's enemies list. Police seized this pistol, which had an extended magazine and distinctive coral snake engraving, similar to a pistol he had in this video posted to social media last year. It's not clear where or when the video was shot, and Singh's lawyer told CBC News he had no comment on it. Police have never said what Amandeep Singh was doing in Brampton, but he doesn't live there all the time. That weekend wedding last November had a notable guest list. You would refer to them as probably Sikh leadership across the country, especially those that are involved in the Khalistan movement. Maninder Bol is a Khalistani or Sikh separatist who was a close collaborator of Hardeep Singh Nijjar. Now it seems like there's a lot of dots that could be connected for that weekend. One of those invited was Gurpat Want Singh Panan, an old friend of Santok Singh Khela, father of the groom. Panan is presumed to be India's number one target. He lives under tight security in New York since U.S. authorities accused Indian government officials of trying to kill him. At the last minute, Panan cancelled his trip to the wedding. I come with a lot of liability. I did not want it to, you know, weigh them under my security threats and bring in, um, you know, all that attention which I bring in when I go and join it. The host says that since the wedding, he's been visited by CSIS and told to take precautions. He and the others have no illusion that the danger to them has gone away. There will be more teams, there are more people uh, uh, around, running around, uh, or everywhere, you know. Uh, we are not scared from them, scared out all, all of them, you know. We don't uh, afraid from the die. While the exact events of that weekend may only emerge at court, six who've spoken to CBC News say they don't believe the timing was a coincidence, and they also don't believe the government of India has given up on its intention to kill them. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel confirmed that four more hostages have been found dead in Gaza. Amaram Cooper, Yoram Metzger, and Haim Perry were all in their 80s. Nadav Popelwell was 51. They were found together in Khan Yunus months ago, according to an Israeli military spokesperson. The circumstances of their deaths under investigation. Israel's military says it struck 50 targets in Gaza over the past day. This one in Al Burej left a huge crater. At one hospital alone, an AP reporter counted 11 bodies, including those of several children. Back here at home, a dramatic development for provincial politics in B.C. Signs that the long-dormant Conservative Party is emerging as a strong contender in the upcoming election. Lindsay Duncombe shows how the change may have to, a lot to do with federal politics. Hello. 
this defection part of a seismic shift in BC politics. Ultimately, I've made this decision to join what really is the largest grassroots movement we've seen in our province. Eleanor Sturko, former RCMP spokesperson, lesbian and rising political star, is the second BC United MLA to leave the official opposition and join the BC Conservatives in just a few days, doubling the caucus from two to four. We're building a broad-based coalition, this grassroots movement across the province, people coming in wanting to see that change. We're BC United. Join us. The defections follow rapidly declining support for BC United. That's the new name for the former BC Liberals, the party of former Premiers Gordon Campbell and Christy Clark. What we appear to be witnessing is the collapse of BC United. The wheels seem to have come off the bus. Vancouver is the third most unaffordable housing market in the world. When you the reason? The income, popularity of the federal income. Conservatives. Pierre Polyev is campaigning against the policies of BC NDP Premier David Eby, blaming Eby and Prime Minister Trudeau for BC's high cost of living and attacking progressive drug policies. Really, I think what is going on is the antipathy that exists across the country for Justin Trudeau, the rise of a conservative movement, which has swept across a lot of British Columbia. The leader of the B.C. Conservatives is a former B.C. Liberal who was kicked out of the caucus for his views on climate change. The Conservatives dropped three candidates for views on LBGTQ rights and COVID vaccinations. B.C. Premier David Eby is currently ahead in the polls, benefiting from a divided right. But if that is changing, the B.C. Conservatives may be a formidable foe. B.C.'s next election is four months away. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News. Vancouver. Some new details tonight about a recent cyber attack on the BC government. The province says 22 employee email accounts may have been accessed in the hack believed to be state sponsored. A handful of these inboxes contain sensitive personal information on 19 individuals. At this time, we have no indication that the general public's information was accessed. BC's public safety minister said the employees affected work in the public service. There was no comment on which country may have been behind the attack or the potential motive. Now to Alberta in a nerve-wracking afternoon southeast of Edmonton after what was likely a tornado touchdown. That funnel cloud was spotted near the village of Edburgh. That's about 120 kilometers southeast of Edmonton. Not clear whether there was any damage. Environment Canada says it is investigating. In the U.S., another court case with potential political implications has begun. This time, the son of President Joe Biden is facing criminal charges accused of making false claims in the process of buying a gun. Katie Simpson shows us how the president's opponents are trying to connect the case to the president. When Hunter Biden arrived at court for his historic federal gun charges trial, members of his family, flanked by the Secret Service, quickly followed. The First Lady sat in the second row, taking notes alongside Hunter Biden's wife and sister. I'm really proud of um, how Hunter has rebuilt his life uh, after addiction. You know, I'm, I love my son. Hunter Biden is charged with falsely filling out paperwork to purchase a gun in 2018, denying he was using illegal drugs at a time when he battled addiction. His former romantic partners, including his brother's widow, are potential witnesses expected to testify about the depths of his illness. That testimony from his closest family and friends is going to be used against him as a basis for putting him in prison. So regardless of how this comes out, even if he's acquitted, this is not going to be a pleasant experience. The trial will fuel new political attacks from Republicans who have long made Hunter Biden a favorite punching bag. Hunter Biden is guilty of so many crimes he can barely even keep track of them. Separate from his criminal charges, Republicans launched an impeachment inquiry alleging Hunter Biden engaged in illegal business deals to help his father, though no credible evidence has been presented. For now, Democrats remain hopeful the trial will not distract from the president's re-election bid. Just to remind the people in this country, Hunter is not running for president of the United States. Joe Biden is, and, and, and Donald Trump is. And I think that when you measure their character, wisdom, and judgment, you understand very clearly that Donald Trump is a danger to our democracy. 
The president would not comment on the case, but in a statement said, as a dad, he has boundless love for his son. If Hunter Biden is found guilty, the maximum penalty is 25 years in prison. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Some tense moments in the U.S. Capitol today as Republican lawmakers investigating the origins of the COVID pandemic grill Dr. Anthony Fauci, who led the U.S. response to the crisis. We should be writing a criminal referral because you should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. You belong in prison, Dr. Fauci. Republicans accuse Fauci of, among other things, trying to cover up the possibility that the pandemic started with a lab leak. Fauci denies those allegations. He has said it's unlikely the virus originated in a lab. This was Fauci's first time testifying publicly about the pandemic response. Mexico has elected its first female president, a leader now tasked with pulling the country forward as it fights violent crime at home and potential conflict at its border. Sasha Petrasik now with Claudia Sheinbaum's rise to power and the work ahead. Claudia Sheinbaum stepped into Mexico City's main plaza. <laughs> cheered as the country's first female president-elect. No llego sola. I did not get here alone, she said, saluting mothers and grandmothers who built Mexico. She also had strong backing from outgoing President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, whose left-wing policies she adopted. It's an important step toward the Mexico we want, he says, with rights for women, the elderly and gay people like me. Schoenbaum swept into office 30 percentage points ahead of her closest challenger, right-wing candidate Xochitl Galvez. I hope she can solve Mexico's problems, she says, pain and violence. Indeed, this campaign was the bloodiest ever, with 38 candidates for various offices assassinated. Popular mayoral candidate Alfredo Cabrera among them shot point-blank last week during a campaign rally. Like most cases, Mexico's drug cartels are blamed. We have been living in Mexico a process of violence, insecurity and penetration of crime organizations trying to get control of local and municipal governments over the past 10 years. Shane Baum's other big challenge? Refugees flooding the U.S. border. American officials say that's eased a little, but they're counting on the new Mexican president to do more. As for Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called Shane Baum to congratulate her, saying the two can work together on issues like gender equality and climate change. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Thursday will mark the 80th anniversary of the Allied invasion of France and the battle that turned the tide of the Second World War. Memories fade, but the sand and the sea still remember, still offer up evidence of what happened here on D-Day. Adrian takes us to Juneau Beach, where Canadian forces landed eight decades ago. Next. Plus how that fateful day unfolded minute by minute. I can just shut my eyes and bring back the time. Newly restored CBC archives take us inside the battle and the great sacrifices that were made. And a little later, after a legendary caddy went down, an Ontario man stepped up. They actually brought in a random person from the gallery. A golf fan gets the experience of a lifetime. We're back in two. The tiny French towns along the beaches in Normandy are filling up this week to mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day. For Canadians, it's Juneau Beach we'll be watching. That's where thousands of Canadians came ashore, where hundreds died, where all pushed back the Nazis to mark the beginning of the end of the war. Adrian's there as part of our special coverage. This is part of Juneau Beach in Normandy. This is where the Canadians landed on June 6, 1944. It's where they captured that house that had been occupied by the Germans. It became the first house liberated in France. 
Memories fade, but the sand and the sea still remember, still offer up evidence of what happened here on D-Day. For example, a Canadian photographer got a little bit curious about what exactly is in all the sand on these beaches. So he scooped some up and sent some samples to a physics professor in Ontario who looked at it under a microscope and discovered small bits of steel and hardened manganese from artillery shells, shrapnel, that is all now clearly, fundamentally, a part of the sand of the beaches of D-Day. The people who live in this community say when they walk these beaches and when they scoop up things that they find, they have sometimes found long red sticks. They look like sticks, but they're not. It's actually cordite, which is a type of hardened, smokeless explosive. And when the sea churns a lot, people here say it also coughs up a lot of that cordite. And then there are the marks just off the beach. It would be very easy to walk by these curves and not really realize what was happening. But if you look closely, all the chunks that are missing from the concrete aren't a matter of wear and tear. This is what happened when the tank tracks moved through the town on D-Day to get towards the center of town. And if over time there was ever a desire to clean this up, just to make it smooth and new, the feeling has been no. Leave it as it is. History has left a mark and it needs to be seen. Starting tomorrow night through Thursday, Adrian will be co-hosting The National from France. And on Thursday, you can also tune in to special CBC News coverage of the 80th anniversary of D-Day hosted by Adrian and starting at 4 a.m. Eastern, 1 a.m. Pacific. After many weeks of voting, now it's time to count the ballots in the world's largest election. He is managing the country very well. So that is why I have elected for him. What India's unprecedented vote could mean for the future of the country. Plus, Canadian troops on the beaches of Normandy 80 years ago. I was hit and knocked off my feet. This, this would be within 15 feet of leaving my landing craft. The CBC Archives brings the horrors of D-Day back to life. And a Canadian team in the Stanley Cup final. They've got grit, they've got heart, they've got the whole town and the whole country behind them. Will Edmonton become Canada's team? The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Some new video tonight of an unfolding emergency in Sri Lanka. Large parts of the country have been hit by flooding and landslides after heavy monsoon rains. At least 10 people have reportedly been killed. And authorities are warning the situation could get worse with more heavy rain in the forecast. We're also watching India, where in just hours results are expected in that country's historic election. Chris Brown now on the record-breaking vote and what many expect will be a resounding win for the incumbent prime minister. In the colorful, colossal exercise of Indian democracy, all that remains now is the counting. Held during some of the hottest weather India has ever seen, the commission that oversaw the six-week vote took what amounted to a bow. We have created a world record of 642 million proud Indian voters. Over the last decade, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is credited with lifting hundreds of millions of Indians out of poverty with business-friendly policies. He is managing the country very well, so that is why I have elected for him. But Modi's critics claim he's pitted Indians against each other by reshaping India primarily as a Hindu country. Early in the campaign, he appeared to refer to the country's 200 million Muslims as infiltrators. The once dominant Congress party cobbled together a coalition of opposition groups and at times appeared to be chipping away at Modi's BJP party, emphasizing that India's new prosperity is lopsided. The poor remain poor and the rich are getting richer, said clothing retailer Vikas Tripoti. Analysts say minorities fear what will happen if Modi wins two-thirds of the seats, as some exit polls suggest is possible. There's long been the suspicion that the BJP has wanted to pass a constitutional amendment that might explicitly refer to India as a Hindu state, a Hindu Rashtra. Louise Tillen says a strengthened Modi 
could also test the patience of Western countries on issues such as human rights. So certainly a, a Modi that comes back with a strong mandate will be similarly emboldened to the Modi who, that we've seen in the last five, five, ten years. India's financial markets appear to have already decided the outcome, with stocks soaring in anticipation of a decisive win for Narendra Modi. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Now it's time to dig deeper into the story shaping our world. Hockey fans dare to dream that the Edmonton Oilers might end the drought and bring the Stanley Cup back to Canada. Because they've got grit, they've got heart. But first, 80 years after D-Day, we show you the landing at Normandy like you've never seen it before. We came in from the sea that morning with a terrific volume of firepower. Footage from that fateful day, now restored and enhanced. There's even rare color film of the forces gearing for battle and soldiers who were there. I was hit and knocked off my feet. Tell us what they went through. It's incredible to realize that all of what you're about to see took place in the course of a single pivotal day. Murray Brewster, our senior defense correspondent, assembled this timeline. CBC was there the moment Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. This is Matthew Holton of the CBC, where our assault formations are ashore, and now fighting like wildcats to hold the bridgeheads. In the decades since, we have documented the eyewitness accounts of hundreds of veterans. Well, I, I tell you, I was quite scared. Our team at the National has spent weeks combing archives to find rarely seen images and to bring you voices now silenced by age. I can just shut my eyes and bring back the time. The experiences of those who were there, now restored. Most of us were violently ill. In order to take you on a journey back to a critical moment when the fate of the free world hung in the balance. It is getting harder to keep history alive. I, I feel very uh, uh, humble being here because I, I seem to represent most of the old soldiers now. There are only 9,200 Canadian Second World War and Korean War veterans left alive to tell their stories. One of them, John Priest, he fought in Europe in 1945 and feels the burden of history. There's only a few left. And, uh, and uh, I don't feel old, and uh, I, f I feel like all the other guy guys, and now I wish all my buddies were here. But at last it started, the enormous bombing and shelling of the coast defenses. We came in from the sea that morning with a terrific volume of firepower. D-Day, 5.10 a.m. The guns of the Royal Navy battleship HMS Warspite were the first to fire. The pivotal battle, the beginning of the end of Nazi Germany, was underway. Along the misty French coastline, 156,000 Allied soldiers prepared to rush an underwater gauntlet of mines and booby traps and to charge the German guns, fortifications, and barbed wire. They landed in daylight at five beaches, hours before Allied paratroopers had dropped behind enemy lines. The 3rd Canadian Infantry Division 14,500 strong went into Juneau Beach with 5,000 assault troops and 2,500 in the initial waves. Those who were there remember the morning as cloudy, raw, and sullen. 6 a.m., the first wave of the Queen's own rifles piled into their assault boats. Hector Elliott, a lieutenant at the time, was with them. He spoke to CBC in 1984. It was about a two mile run into the coast and we spent those two hours bobbing up and down in these little boats and we had seasick bags. So uh, I suppose in a, in a way it was a bit of a blessing because our minds were taken off the reality of landing on a beach by, by being ill, being very sick. 6.15 a.m. The assault boats begin their long, slow journey to the beach amid heavy seas. Captain Eddie Goodman of the Fort Garry Horse Regiment led a Sherman tank unit ashore. He spoke to CBC in 1994. 
it was a mixed mood. Some people were exhilarated, quite a few. Uh, some people were pensive and thoughtful about what they were going into. 8.02 a.m., the North Shore Regiment of New Brunswick landed at Saint-Aubin-sur-Mer, while at 8.05 a.m., just to the west, A and B companies of the Queen's Own Rifles touched the beach at Bernier-sur-Mer. Lance Corporal Rolf Jackson was with B Company when the ramps went down. He spoke to CBC in 1998. I was hit and knocked off my feet. This, this would be within 15 feet of leaving the landing craft. And when I came up out of the water, there wasn't many of the section left. The section of 10 men, seven of them were killed before they got out of the water. In the skies over Normandy, squadron leader James Stocky Edwards, one of Canada's highest scoring aces, was looking down from the cockpit of his Spitfire. The water was very rough down there. They were putting people off in, in, in when it should be shallow and deep, and they're going under water with the tanks and, and troops with their gear on. But other than that, uh, there were lots of good, good things, and the landing was a success. But there were a lot of, a lot of suffering from it. 8.05 a.m. Canadian troops reported being under intense fire with the Germans lobbing 16 shells a minute onto Juneau Beach. Major Charles Dalton was also with the Queen's Own Rifles and landed directly in front of a concrete bunker. He spoke to CBC in 1984. The man on my right <clears throat> was hit six or seven times in his left arm and I was not hit. If I had been in his place, or a little closer to him, then I would have got those bullets down the center. But I did not get hit until I got to the wall. I got all the way in. But everybody to my right was a casualty one way or another. Almost half of Dalton's company was lost coming across the beach. The Queen's Own took the highest casualties of any Canadian unit on D-Day, 143 dead and wounded. In a fit of daring, a handful of Queen's Own made their way up the beach and around behind German defenders, driving them back from the shore. It was largely the same story all along the Canadian beachhead, with the Winnipeg Rifles, the Regina Rifles, and the North Shore Regiment of New Brunswick clawing their way forward with tanks and artillery supporting them. 9 a.m., Bernier-sur-Mer was cleared. Local residents who had been sheltering in their homes during the Allied bombardment and fighting were overjoyed. They showered the Canadians with food and apple brandy, known as Calvados. Along the Orne River and the Conn Canal, Canadian paratroopers fighting with the British 6th Airborne guarded the eastern flank of the invasion against a German counterattack. Despite being scattered all over the drop zone, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion cut the bridges at Verivelle and Robillon. Sergeant Merv Jones spoke to CBC in 1964 about the jitters of his nighttime jump. Well, I, I tell you, I was quite scared. And I even asked the jump master at this specific time if we could change places. But we'd been so trained in this light business, red, don't go, green, go, that he says, oh, no, don't worry about it. Uh, we haven't got time to change you. That when the red, green light did come on, automatically due to my training, out I went. Eleven forty-five a.m. As captured in this rare color footage shot on D-Day, the Third Division deployed its reserves, infantry, tanks, and artillery in a second wave. It was the job of HMCS Algonquin and other Allied warships to keep up the bombardment on surviving German fortifications. Some of which didn't surrender until late afternoon. Further out in the English Channel that day, Alex Polowin aboard HMCS Huron. Now, our job, like many people pointed out to me, well, you guys were lucky. You, you bombarded the coast and then you left. Nothing like that. You know, we were in the channel about seven months. Our job was to protect the people that were going, that were going in for D-Day, their, their, their ships, their boats that were there. That was our job, to find the enemy ships that were doing that, that were coming down to do that. We did, we prevented them. The Navy's other job that day, to evacuate the wounded back to England. By the end of D-Day, Canadian casualties totaled 1,096, of whom 381 were killed in action and 574 wounded. 
a far cry from the 1,800 casualties Canadian military planners had expected. Noon on D-Day, German commanders on the ground had warned beforehand the invasion would have to be crushed on the beach. Hitler, believing Normandy to be a feint, refused to release his panzer divisions until late in the day. An advisor to German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, Admiral Friedrich Ruge, says by then it was too late. Ruge spoke to CBC in 1984. We knew that it, uh, the battle was lost. You see. When? when? At once, as soon as their uh, third front uh, started forming. 5.30 p.m., the Germans counterattacked. Although bloodied, the Canadian lines held. It was a taste of what was to come. In the weeks that followed, Normandy turned into a killing ground. It took over 80 days for the Allies to break out and then sweep northeast through France, Belgium, Holland, and into Germany helping to deliver a death blow to the Third Reich. By sunset on June 6th, Lance Corporal Rolf Jackson of the Queen's Own could look back at the beach and see the price of the victory to come. I watched my sergeant, a Jewish lad, Freddie Harris, first out of our craft, never got out of the water. Johnny Gibson, my corporal, never got out of the water. Fred Eamon, a rifleman, never got out of the water. Ted Westerby, never got out of the water. John Kirkland, Boynton, neither one of them got out of the water. Doug Reed, my number two on the gun, never got out of the water. Al Kennedy, my gun, Bren Gunner, never got out of the water. Doug Reed's brother, the two of them are buried in uh, six feet apart at Benny Samir at the cemetery. These are people I remember. These are, these are only my guys, my tent. Eighty years later, a final salute. John Priest makes sure to place his candle atop the gravestone of General Harry Criar, who led the Canadian Army during the campaign in Northwest Europe. This is too much. It takes me back to the old days. <laughs> I think all these guys here, don't forget, Oh, well, so many of them I, I knew. And many of them were, were much older than me, you know, in those days. We had young men. There is much more to remember and to learn from that historic day. Starting tomorrow, Adrian will co-host The National from France for three nights with new interviews and stories. And on Thursday, on that 80th anniversary of D-Day, Adrian will host the CBC Network special starting at 4 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up, it's been decades since a Canadian team won the Stanley Cup. Are you guys Oilers fans? Now I am, yeah. How fans across the country are cheering on the Oilers? Next. Hockey fans tell us why Canada needs to get behind the Oilers. We need some unity in this country. It's been 31 long years since the Stanley Cup came north. Everybody would be so joyous. Now Edmonton carries the country's hopes into battle with the help of a not-so-secret weapon. I think he is what hockey is and means to Canada. Nick Ferdinand set out to determine the mood of some truly devoted hockey lovers. Turns out they weren't hard to find. Okay, so that's what all the fuss is about. The Stanley Cup, the holy grail of hockey. Now, you've probably heard by now that a Canadian team hasn't won the thing in a long, long time. So I've come to the Hockey Hall of Fame to talk to hockey fans of all shapes and sizes to find out if they can get behind the Edmonton Oilers. Can the Edmonton Oilers become Canada's team? Absolutely. That's Canada's team. The, the Oilers are going to win the, win the Cup and bring it home because they've got grit, they've got heart, they've got the whole town and the whole country behind them. We're gonna bring Stanley home. Really? Surely not everybody can be rooting for the Oilers. Are you guys Oilers fans? Now I am, yeah. What do you mean? Well, now that they're in the finals, yeah. I'm not really a fan as much as I just want them to win the cup. The first Canadian team to win a cup in a while. That'll be good for us. 
Do you guys think it's possible for the country to get behind the Oilers? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So what is it about the Oilers that we can all get behind? If I say Oilers, what's the very first thing that comes to mind? Uh, McDavid. <laughs> I think that he's a really, really hard worker. Uh, I think he's a team player. I think that he's a consummate professional. He's someone for all these little kids that you see running around here to look up to, you know? And are you guys Oilers fans? No, I'm not. Yeah, kind you're, of. You're not. Kind of. No, you're not. OK, sure, no. No? <laughs> no. Because the Oilers are in the final, can you become an Oilers fan? No, I don't think I can be an Oilers fan. They got my team out. I'm a Canucks fan. What would it mean to you for a Canadian team to win the cup? Very good. Yeah, we haven't won it in a while, so I think it would feel amazing to get one finally. What kind of fan are you? Uh, Maple Leaf fan. Can you get behind the Oilers? Yes, no problem. How come? Well, because they're a Canadian team and uh, they play exciting hockey. What do you think it would mean for the country if, if the Oilers brought the Stanley Cup back? I, I think everybody would be so joyous. Like, it, it would uplift everything, right? Is that something we need right now? There is so much going on in the world and in Canada, and um, we need to bring the West, the Central, East, and the Maritimes all together. Tell me what you're wearing. Uh, I mean, one of my best jerseys, Connor McDavid. I mean, perfect time to wear it, I figured. Do you think the country can get behind the Oilers? I, I would say so, I think so. With how many Canadians are on the roster in Edmonton, I think that, I think we should at least. <laughs> I don't know if we can, but we should. Then I meet Randy. Let me know if you aren't cheering for the Oilers after listening to him. What about you, what kind of fan are you? I'm an Oilers fan. How come? I'm a season ticket holder. Been the season ticket holder for 15 years. Live and breathe and die Oilers. What do they mean to you? Like, what do you get out of it? Uh, it's, it's a sense of purpose. It, it gives meaning to life. What do you think it would mean for the country if, if the Edmonton Oilers won? Oh, I think it would be just amazing right now. We, we need some unity in this country, and I think it's something that the country could all stand behind. How would you convince someone to be an Oilers fan right now? Because they play true, real hockey. They're an honest team. They work hard. That's what hockey really is. If somehow you were in the dressing room before game one, what would you say? What would be your message to the team? I say, leave it all on the ice, guys. Oh, God, boys, please do it. Please do it. Yeah, that's, that, that's my thought. We got to win. Yeah. So the Oilers are in the Stanley Cup final for the first time in 18 years. Their best of seven series against the Florida Panthers starts on Saturday night in Sunrise, Florida. Up next, a fan bumps shoulders with the pros. Next thing you know, I'm shaking hands with, you know, Shane Lowry and his caddy, Darren. The surprise caddy in our moment. A golf fan living his dream. It happened to the Canadian Open yesterday when he got to fill in for a well-known caddy. Going from the gallery to the greens tonight, his moment on the fairways makes our moment. We were walking down the third fairway, uh, you know, outside the ropes. And then we heard a large, you know, boom and uh, ow and a groan. And we looked over. Mike Fluff Cowan had uh, slipped and fallen down the hill. CT Pan's walking over to the uh, ropes with him to help him get off the hole. And uh, I just said to CT, uh, do you need a hand? He said yes, and next thing you know, I was helping Fluff take his bib off and uh, walking up the fairway. They actually brought in a random person from the gallery. Next thing you know, I'm shaking hands with, you know, Shane Lowry and his caddy Darren and, and CT. I couldn't believe what was going on, and then CT rolls in a birdie, no big deal, and then he was sort of coaching me on how to, you know, where to be and where not to be and that kind of thing. We're walking up the fifth fairway and someone approached the two of us and said he'd been sent by caddy services to replace me. And, you know, my initial reaction was, you know, what the heck, man, I'm having a great time. But at the same time, uh, it all made a lot of sense. <laughs> I'll probably stick to the day job that my boss pointed out I should do. Okay, so random spectator becomes caddy. We've had the Zamboni driver in Toronto who is the emergency backup goalie in an NHL game. I'm trying to figure, is there any way in other sports this kind of replacement could happen football or formula one i don't think so for all of us here at the national thanks for being with us you can watch anywhere anytime on the free cbc news app and subscribe to the national's youtube channel i'm ian hannah mansing in vancouver see you tomorrow night